Good morning. This is Pastor Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church. This morning in our Bible study, we're going to be looking at one of those questions that bother people about prayer, and that is, where is God when I hurt? Is he hiding his face from us? Is there any way I can talk to God when there seems to be a kind of a ceiling above me and the prayers are not reaching the highest heaven? Lord God, uh, uh, hear our prayer as we pray. Teach us to pray and keep us from uh, neglecting prayer for any reason. We thank you in the name of Jesus. So this morning, this idea of does God ever turn his face away from us? And what is God's face anyway? We have um, several with us in the Bible class this morning. I want you to see their faces. Uh, and uh, and greet them. And there are other people that are watching at another time, like on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Now let's continue with our, our Bible study and put this back to the side by side. The Lord loves to hear us pray. I hope you believe that. And he never is going to say, I don't want to hear you. In the, in the, in the midst of any kind of trouble, uh, the Lord loves to hear us pray. He also loves to hear us pray when things are going well and we want to give him thanks and praise and, and, and wonderful blessings coming upon us so that we are overwhelmed with his mercies. The Lord loves to hear us pray. One time David prayed, you have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. And here we have that idea of God's face. Any idea what is God's face? You have any guesses? We like guesses. What is God's face? Does anybody see God's face? Literally? Doesn't the Bible say... No one looks upon God and lives. Those are good answers. <laughs> because I ask questions, as you know, from listening and talking with me over the past years, that I love to ask questions to which no one knows the answer. It opens the mind and the heart. If we have time today, and I really doubt that we'll get to it, we can look at David's prayer in Psalm 30. And you can do it for homework. Here is the question. Does the Lord ever hide his face from us? And if so, why does he do it? And how do we get back with God if it feels like God has hidden his face from us? Those are open questions yet. All right. So let's talk about God's face. <clears throat> When does God bless us? Mm. <clears throat> I'd say during the sacraments. Go ahead. During the during the sacraments, he he blesses well, he blesses us when we're baptized, he blesses us when we're married, he blesses us at funerals, he blesses us when we have communion. All right. right. Those special moments. Yeah, I was going to say he even blesses us probably when we were conceived with parents that were happy to uh, know they were going to have a child. Uh, right. Like uh, Hannah and like Elizabeth. Right, right. I often think of them. Here's a special uh, blessing that comes very regularly in our lives if we worship. When is that? Oh, when our sins are forgiven at the beginning of the service? Uh, correct. What other time? At the end, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Let's look at that one. When God blesses us, the word bless means he's bestowing good to us and for us. And also for those we love. When God blesses us, he grants what we need, even without our asking. 
when God blesses us, he gives us both things for this life and for our spiritual nature. And when God blesses us, he gives without any merit or worthiness in us. He, this is what it means to, for God to grace us. To, the grace word means we didn't earn it or deserve it. All right? It was free. So what you um, mentioned, Evelyn, is, is here in Numbers 6. And uh, I'm going to ask Judy to read it. Okay. Uh, the Lord spoke, spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his son, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. That blessing has been a part of worship for about three millennia. Uh, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, I want you to do this. And Aaron, serving as Moses spokesman, did this blessing. And it continued. It has continued to this day. And in many, not all worship services, this ends the, the service, or the hymn does after this. But I want you to look at the words I underlined, which Judy emphasized when she read it. This is the blessing. He makes his face, we're talking about God's face. What does it mean? He makes his face shine upon us. Now, shine is the opposite of frown. All right, think about that. We're going to talk more about that. And be gracious to you. So God's lifting up his face upon us is his grace being shown to us in all the ways that that grace comes. And then lifting up his countenance. The word countenance is a translation of the same word as the word face in verse 24. So this idea of face I put in brackets as an interpretation. Lift up his countenance upon you. That means look upon you with favor. And what would be the opposite? Would God ever look upon us with disfavor? And when would that be? Well, when we sin. That's right. We go against him. And because we are always in need of the saving grace and as a result, we have peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5. So he puts their name on, on them. He put his name on you when you were baptized. And he continues to put his name on you when this blessing is spoken. These are not just words. This is God blessing. I want you to think about that at the end of the worship service. I know that when you have small children and you come to the end of the table prayer, the children are waiting for the word amen. <laughs> and if you ask small children, what does amen mean? They, means, they say it means we can eat. <laughs> <laughs> Until they know what it means. When you have a worship service and you get to the end and the pastor raises his hand and he puts this blessing by the Lord's command upon the people. What does that mean? It means we can go home now if you want to be like small children. But it really means what it says. I think sometimes what we miss in God's word is that God's word is operative. It's working. It has power. And it does what God says it's going to do. I am going to bless you. You understand what I'm, I'm emphasizing here? that you just don't say, oh, okay, those words, I know those words. Many people can say them because they've heard them every Sunday, all their lives. It changed slightly, but the meaning is still the same. So what is the face of God? Getting a better idea? Mm -hmm. Anyone want to try? 
what is the face of God? I want to reintroduce a term that we talked about some years ago, and we bring it up from time to time when it's in a Bible passage, and that is the word anthropomorphism, right? I said it spelled it out in syllables. Anthropomorph, that's big letters, means the accent is there. Morphism. I want you all to try to say it. Anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism. Good. Now, what does that mean? Uh, well, here's the definition. Well, uh, do you want to make a definition of your own before I give you one? Okay. This is a definition that fits. It's the attribution of human characteristics or behavior to God. Now, at first, it might seem like, well, we shouldn't be doing that. We shouldn't be attributing to God human characteristics because God is not a man. Okay. He carries the word, he carries the pronoun he, which you can deal with at another time. But it's the attribution of, attribution, big word. Okay. It means we're saying things about God as though he were human. Right. For example, the Bible speaks of God's eyes and his hands, and his feet, and his ears. You can look those words up in a concordance, an index to the Bible, and you'll find that God seems to have eyes, and hands, and feet, ears. And for example, he molded man out of the dust of the ground, and he planted a garden, and he took his rest, and he walked in the garden. All of those verbs are used in Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. Well, so the Bible uses anthropomorphisms in order to talk to us about God in ways that we might understand. And in fact, the Bible presents God's face as one of these anthropomorphisms. Okay? So we have God looking upon us with his face. And at times, we see his face, though not in a literal way. You got that? Anthropomorphism, God's face. So the face of God is spoken of in Psalm 4, verse 6. Now, Judy read, is there another volunteer to read? There are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. I love that verse. When people are down, they forget that God is the one who shows us good. And if God lifts up the light of his face upon us, we have all we need. We have that look of his favor and blessing. Here's another. Of, Go ahead. I, I think of it as his being. I never imagined it as his physical face, but his whole being, the being God. Yeah, you're correct. It's his nature toward us. It, it, it's based on the relationship that he has established. So I like the way you said it's his whole being and not just his countenance. But of course, we're focusing on that. When you look at a person, um, you know a lot about the person right away from the face, right? Here's another example from Job 33, 26. We're going to study this later on this morning. Another volunteer to read if I can have one. Or back to you, Judy. Okay, then he will pray to God and he will accept him that he may see his face with joy and he may restore his righteousness to man. So we have the prayer and the acceptance of God and our seeing God's face with joy based on our faith that God has accepted us. And God is restoring righteousness 
that's quite a bit of uh, revelation of God uh, in one verse. We're going to come back to that. The blessing of God is, is something important. It's his divine provision and protection. Now, you might say, well, you're leaving out salvation here. I'm really not because he has provided the salvation for us and he daily protects us from harm and danger. Now, when he makes his face shine upon us, it is only because he decides in his grace that God decides not to frown on our sins, but freely to forgive them because of Christ's sacrifice. So there is God's provision and protection also so that we are not condemned forever because of our sins. The blessing of God's face lifted up upon us is that he shows us his favor. And the result is our wholeness and well-being. Because we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Any comments on that? His blessing. Okay, we'll go on. What is the face of God? I keep asking that question because we're trying to get a, a, a more full understanding. And I'm not going to say definition, but a full understanding of the face of God as this comes to us in the Bible. So I'm going to read a, a rather long passage here, three from nine, six verses. And I'm going to read it because I want to do something important with it. And it requires us to, to study it in a little bit more detail. All right. So hang on. If there is an angel as mediator for him, one out of a thousand to remind a man what is right for him, then let him be gracious to him and say, Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. Let his flesh become fresher than in youth. Let him return to the days of his youthful vigor. Then he will pray to God, and he will accept him, that he may see his face with joy, and he may restore his righteousness to man. He will sing to men and say, I have sinned and perverted what is right and it is not proper for me. He has redeemed my soul from going to the pit, and my life shall see the light. Now that is quite a bit to swallow in uh, one gulp. All right. You see the words that I've under underlined? Mediator, yeah. ransom. I've got face, righteousness, and redemption. This is in the Old Testament. It sounds an awful lot like New Testament talk to me, doesn't it? If I capitalized those words, mediator and ransom, and maybe righteousness, you'd be getting a, a bigger hint. So let's take the verses that are important to us and single them out the mediator and the ransom and the face and the righteousness and the redemption and talk about those words. The face of God is, is God's approving look, his acceptance based on the ransom, that's verse 24, the mediator in verse 23, and you see I've capitalized it because I'm trying to make a connection with the New Testament, who restores us and redeems our life. Who is our redeemer? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He is the ransom, isn't he? Correct. He, he, his was the ransom price, his life, his blood. And he is the one mediator between God and man. So he has redeemed our lives from going down to the pit. Now, the word pit in the Old Testament has different definitions depending on the context. Sometimes it means just the grave. And uh, at times it has a, a deeper meaning. Here it is. Who are we talking about? What book of the Bible is this in? This is in, you said, uh, yep. Job. Yeah, it's in, 
It's in Job 33. A pit could be a pit of depression. It could be when we feel uh, out on the outs with God. Mm -hmm. And that's a good time uh, to pray. And it's also a very difficult time to pray. So from Job 33, Elihu is speaking. And he, Elihu um, doesn't really know much. And the, the three friends, you remember, if you studied it before, that the three friends who come to, to Job to try to comfort him in his great affliction, because he has lost his 10 children and their families in a, in a great uh, windstorm. And he has uh, been afflicted uh, by Satan with, with sores from his head to his feet. And he is sitting in sackcloth and ashes, and he is miserable. And his friends come to try to comfort him. It's a difficult place to be. Now, Elihu has this advice, and Elihu is saying more than he understands. Some interpreters of the Old Testament, when they study this angel as a mediator, they believe, as I do, that this is the angel of the Lord. This is the pre-incarnate Christ. I can't prove that from this, from this text, but it is a common thing that the angel of the Lord comes and is, the, is Jesus before he is in the flesh as Jesus. The Christ is eternal, right? I don't do a lot of theology this morning, but I have to say at least that much. And he is the ransom price, and, and, and so forth. So this fits the definition of Jesus Christ, who does redeem our lives from going down to eternal death. And that's the other meaning of the word pit. And why does God do this? Well, purely out of his grace and mercy, restoring righteousness to us. This is the righteousness of Christ. Because Jesus is our righteousness. You can find that in Jeremiah 23 and Jeremiah 33 and 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. Jesus is our righteousness and his righteousness is awarded to us. And all our wrongness is taken away and forgiven. We live in that. We go back to it again and again, day after day, no matter what's going on in our lives. Now, when does the Bible study become a sermon? <laughs> and when does a sermon become a Bible study? There's not a great difference, although there are two different verbs in the New Testament, proclamation and teaching. So we have the face of God in this approving look, his acceptance. So what is the face of God? I'm asking again. Read from Ecclesiastes 9, verse 7. Go oh, then. Eat your bread in happiness and drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already approved your works. God takes pleasure in, he delights in his people as they constantly do his will. Thank you. His will is outlined in Ephesians 2. I think you memorized Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved, not of works, let any man boast so that you would walk in his works which he has prepared beforehand, his will. He takes pleasure in his people. He delights in his people. God's face, as we take it in context of these verses, is his approval, his blessing. And you see it. No, you don't see it with your eyes. You see it with your faith. Because you know, when you are on the outs with someone in your life, and I hope you are not now, but think of a time when you're on the outs with someone. <clears throat> and I've said this before in this class, you tend to avoid the person that you're on the outs with. You don't want to look at their face. And you notice that their face is not looking at you with uh, any kind of kindness or pleasure. Anybody want to comment on that idea? Humans, humanly speaking. Yeah, I was going to say, I think facial expressions um, tell an awful lot in a person. And you can you know, tell if you um, dislike somebody or 
um, roll your eyes, <laughs> like, oh, well, uh, all those types of things. Or I guess when we get to the fact that um, God shines his light on us when we're happy and when we're walking in his grace, we truly radiate his light. You are a, reflect, you're a reflection of God in this world. Yeah. Right. When someone is on uh, against you, and you and they come upon you, many times they are looking away. They are looking down. We don't want God's face to be looking down. We want it to be lifted up upon us. So we could spend a lot of time. The, the word face in the Bible with God's face is used many times. But I believe this is going to be enough for our purposes. And the reason I'm spending all this time on God's face is we're going to study Psalm 30, in which uh, the word face is used in a special way. And if I started there, we wouldn't have the full understanding of it. So I'm laying the groundwork for something we may not get to till next week. Okay. I, I take a look at the clock every once in a while. So the idea of God's face is God's approval, God's acceptance, God's blessing, and God's gracious and saving presence. Perhaps you could add some more words to that. But I think that sums it up. I was going to add love. Um, it's love. Thank you. We can put that in there. What were you going to say, Bobby? I thought him I heard his voice. Uh, no, I, I I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. Okay, thank you. So now let's connect God showing His face with His openness to hear our prayer. Because remember, I had announced we're still talking about God loves to hear us pray. And in a way, you might say that. Just the mere fact that he wants to hear us pray is his showing his face toward us. He's listening to us. In one of the psalm verses, he bends his ear toward us. Isn't that, isn't that a beautiful human way of talking about God's openness to our prayer? So let's go ahead. I was going to say he he wants to hear us. He wants us to talk to him, not text him, but talk to him. <laughs> yeah. And as I often say, anytime, anywhere, any place, about anything. Let's see an important reason for prayer, and then inside of this, we're going to talk about a hindrance to prayer. And I guess I could have announced that as our topic this morning. What gets in the way of our prayers? But there are so many things in that list. We're just talking about one particular hindrance to prayer. And we're going to center our attention on a couple of verses in Psalm 30. But first, I, I want you to read aloud the entire psalm so we get it in context. This is a psalm of David, the entire Psalm 30. It's not real long. So um, who's going to take a deep breath and read the whole thing? I, I remember how, how many verses it's got. About 12, I think. Who's up for this? You have it printed out, Pastor? I have it on the screen. I'm, I'm okay. waiting for your volunteerness. Well, I'll give it a try. Okay, give it a try. Uh, Francis, uh, you're welcome to chime in here anytime. You're part okay. of us. If Francis wants to read it, she can start. You can start, Francis. Well, how about, do you want someone to read the whole thing? Yes, and I'm going to put it on the screen uh, two or three verses at a time. So you can read it off the screen. You don't have to have your Bible open. You know how I like to keep us on the same page. You begin, and if you if you run out of steam, we'll have someone pick up, all right? All right. Were you referring to me? Yes, but first I want to give you the outline. In other words, before we read it, let's say, well, what is Psalm 30 about? It's about prayer. It's about praise. It's about thanksgiving for help. Psalm 30 is also about merciful discipline. Ooh and confession of sin, and humility. And you'll see the connection. All right, Psalm 30, verses 1 through 12. Go ahead, Francis. 
I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned me for my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Thank you, Francis. Isn't that a beautiful sound? It is, but unfortunately, when you read it, you're more concerned about getting the words right than by really hearing it. So I'm looking forward to our discussion about it. All right, that's, that's a good comment. I'm glad you said that. And I really believe that trying to read any parts of the Bible in a hurry, aloud or by, or by yourself, is not as productive as uh, turning to a psalm like this and, and reading a verse that may uh, be appropriate. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. When Jesus was about to be crucified for our sins, this verse comes up. And on Easter morning, there was joy unspeakable. And when someone is suffering the loss of a loved one, this helps. You see, one of the, one of the arts of, of, of working with people is to find parts of the scriptures which apply in a particular situation. It's kind of like going to the pharmacy, as you've seen me do many times, and pulling out a particular remedy for healing. And we're going to look at these two verses in detail and making them uh, see how we, making us see how they apply to our, our lives in, in this particular situation. So there's a lot of praise in here for what God has done. All right, we're not going to look at every verse. But thank you for saying that, Francis, because we do need to slow down and meditate on the words and the phrases and think about how they apply. And then two years later, when we look at Psalm 30, but well, I, I looked at that some time ago, but I didn't see that in there. Mm -hmm. uh, because your situation changes and you make self-applications. I received a, a letter in the mail and the email uh, and read it this morning and it came from our district president. And uh, he said, at this time in his life, he has begun to meditate on the Psalms and found them very helpful. Hmm. Let's concentrate on verses six and seven in the time that we have left today. And that's these two verses. As for me, this is David. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. <laughs> By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face. I was dismayed. 
prosperity, never be moved, favor, mountain. What mountain is David talking about? He's saying the Lord made it stand strong. Then you hid your face. Oh, that's like someone striking a discordant chord on the piano. And I was dismayed. You know, when, when you stay strong, you hid your face. I'm wondering many times, did Jesus really turn his face away from us? Or is it we turn our face away from him and no longer see him? God turns his face against us mm. when we sin. And then he turns his face toward us in Christ and forgives. That's the most simple way I can put it. It is true that we in our lives turn our face and our whole ways away from him, against him. But here, we're, this, this prayer of David, he is saying he became dismayed when he was aware that God had hidden his face. I didn't say that, but the Holy Spirit inspired David to write this. So I'm not going to quarrel with, with the language. I'm going to say, well, what was it? And that's what, <laughs> what we're going to study here. What was it that made God hide his face from David? The word prosperity here, if we look it up in a dictionary of Hebrew words, means security or success or ease, or kind of a personal pride and accomplishment. All right, just a simple idea. Prosperity is not just money in the bank or having land and property, or even the fact that David was king. Don't forget that David was king. But he didn't always have this security and success. He had enemies against him all the time. He was not always at ease. But at this point in his life, he had said in his prosperity, I shall never be moved. Now I put a tone into that because that's what it means. When things were going well, that's what I want to apply to us as we get about as far. Let's see, we started about 10 after and we're going, we're, we're at about 40 minutes now. Let's apply this to our lives, verses six and seven. As for me, and this could be you, one of us, we could have said in our prosperity when things were going well, I shall never be moved. I'm doing pretty well, actually. By your favor, O oh Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. And that mountain can be anything in our lives which is in which we find our security and our rest uh, for David. His mountain was not uh, the place on which the temple stood, but his mountain was the strength of him and all of the forces that David had at his disposal to de defend his country, Israel. He's the king of Israel, the 12 tribes. So he admits that it was by God's favor that God had made his mountain stand strong. And then you hid your face, and I was dismayed. Now, well, before we go any further, I, I want you to enter into this idea and recall, now, if you will, a time when things were going well for you. You were in a good place financially. You had good health. The people in your family had good health. Um, you had love and not a whole lot of anger was going on, and you felt like, well, nothing bad is going to happen. I don't know whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. You might live on either side of that road. I, uh, I tried to learn as a child to walk on the sunny side of the street. Pastor. Yes, go ahead. Um, 
I'm confused with I shall never be moved. Yeah. I reading it by itself to me that's an emotional moved emotionally but is is that what he means? He I means his, he means his, I'm going to answer your question the best I can. He means his life is not going to be disturbed in any negative way. Oh, okay. And that could include his emotions but also his security because in my prosperity, my security, my peace, if things are going well, I shall never be moved. So I'm asking you, was there a time in your life when you felt like David? I shall never be moved. I think of several times, but of course, something bad happened. So it, um, you know, I think when we're young, we think, the world is, our lives are ahead of us, everything's going right, and, um, and then it doesn't turn out that way. <laughs> I think you're right, uh, the same thing. When you're young, you don't think of thing, bad things happening. You just go on your way. And as you get older, then something happens, and uh, you have to deal with it. I, I can say the same thing, you know, also when young, but I think even as we get older and even walking with the Lord, um, as we approached our retirement, you know, both John and I were looking forward to our retirement, looking forward to doing a little traveling, living here in South Florida where it's nice and warm. Um, you know, we had made up for some loss financially and we're doing quite well. And then, um, and then the diagnosis of dementia was given to John. And that was a huge blow that suddenly like blew us out of the water, that retirement we were looking forward to and everything was kind of all of a sudden shattered for, uh, you know, until we got our feet back on the floor and uh, we looked at things. So uh, that was probably a time. You don't think, you know, something like that's gonna happen. Okay, thank you for sharing. Anybody else? Well, I think about my mother. Um, she was only 20 years older than me, and she died at 60. So I was 40, and we were planning things, going on a cruise. We were, uh, my father had died already. And, you know, we thought we had at least 15 years. Yeah. Then got a diagnosis in September, and she died in the next February. And it, um, you know, we had such plans. Thank goodness we did some of them. Mm -hmm. Then instead of waiting, I tell people, I try to tell my daughter, particularly, you know, you're waiting for this mythical retirement when you're going to do everything you need to do now. You need to go on vacations now um, because, you know, and like my husband, he thought when he retired, he would, uh, well, first of all, we would stay in the Keys. We had a second home down there at that time. But um, he would go on the boat every day and he would play golf. And he's not physically able to do either one. And it happened right after he retired at 59. Um, so we did it then instead of waiting for that mythical time. So, um, so that was good. How much time do we have? This moment. You know the answer to that. We have, we have a moment giving us right now. Right. This moment. Yeah. Well, I think you know my situation. And uh, oh, about a year ago, I was kind of saying in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. And then the diagnosis came in September and for a moment, it seemed like God had hidden his face. I knew better, I knew better, but the feelings that overwhelmed me, and I'm not gonna go into detail today, were just very hard, very hard. So, that's where we go from here. The, just as you have been relating, and, and thanks again for sharing, when things were going well, 
there came a crisis, a, a failing, a terrible disease, or someone in your family or you yourself, and it was like the hiding of God's face. Uh, something threatened your peace, your prosperity, your uh, everything is going well feeling. Now the pessimists who live with this, um, they have an awful thing that goes inside of them. And it goes like this, is when things are going well, I know something bad is going to happen. I hope you don't live like that. Mm -mm. Because it's a way of denying God's uh, eminent and, and total goodness. It's a way of saying to God, I don't think you can handle this. Uh, or it's a way of uh, hiding yourself in your own security. And uh, that's, that's a false God. Or a way of, of denying that the ultimate goodness of God is going to come and he's going to love you no matter what. Am I getting too maudlin? No, this is how we live our lives when something seems to, to hide uh, God's peace. So I have already asked the question, never been in that place, and you've already shared. Does anyone have anything else uh, you'd like to add? Well, I think as a Christian, and maybe this is, you know, you're going to get into that, but as a Christian, thankfully, after we uh, uh, get back on our feet and have had some time to think things through and uh, call on our Christian friends, it goes back to asking them to pray for us during that period of time and help us to get through and carry the burden to get through that time in our life and to help to give us pray for direction in our life and those types of things. Um, that's, I think, where our faith really truly comes in and uh, picks us up and carries us very well. So, Judy, you're saying uh, don't, don't be alone when this happens. No, that's, that's where having, having um, the family of uh, Christ around you, uh, the body of Christ, uh, is so important. Um, it's, you know, it's important all the time. We should be praying for one another all the time. But especially when we hit these lows in our life, it really becomes an important uh, uh, time for us. In our, been, go ahead. We've been talking about our own physical health, but I'm, I'm feeling now that God is hiding his face uh, to our country. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's very difficult to determine things are in disarray in so many ways that you can't seem to get hold on it. I, uh, I don't want to go into particular news events here in the Bible study. That, that would be a, a good thing for us at another time. Oh, but the, the, the very thing we're talking about, the things were going well in many situations, and then suddenly comes this COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And it is like the hiding of God's face to many people. You understand that there's a direct application there. And if, if that is bothering you, that's the time to say, Lord, you make my mountain stand strong. I am dismayed now. And go back and read the whole psalm. These psalms weren't meant to be picked apart like this word by word and one verse at a time. It's one prayer. But I'm wanting to make the application to God's face here. You understand? It seems like God has hidden his face. So the superscription that is on top of this psalm would lead us in another direction. And that's why I think this is a good place to end our, our study this morning, or whenever you're listening to it, watching it on YouTube. This is our wonderful group that gathers together on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock 
and they are remnants of the Bible study that used to gather in the upstairs conference room at Trinity Lutheran Church. And we are separated now by necessity. And we were brought together by the magic of Zoom, which is provided to the congregation a, a, a license. And we're using that. And that way we don't have to pay any extra fees. This is Pastor Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. I invite you to, uh, to join us every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock by going to trinitydelray.org forward slash live. And there you will find our worship service at 8.30 and 10.30. And you'll also find the Bible study at 10 o'clock. God bless you. Make his face shine upon you. Lift up his countenance upon you, his divine favor, and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.